come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream to. The second I saw the technology, I knew it would be a revolution for the toy industry. There have been only a few toys that represented technology breakthroughs, and those have been more in the science project area than in consumer products with broad-based appeal. It is definitely being marketed as a toy, not an electronics product. Our mandate is not technology for technology's sake, but technology for the kids' sake. Don Kingsborough. The former president of the Atari Corporation's sales and marketing division, Don Kingsborough, was sunning himself on a beach in Hawaii during the 1984 holiday season. At the age of 37, he had vowed never to work again. Those plans were derailed when he received a phone call from Ken Forsey in a last ditch effort to raise interest in his company's animated talking teddy bear. Don had never heard of Ken Forsey, but he thought the toy might be worth looking at. Still, it took weeks for him to talk himself off the beach and onto a plane back to California. I remember we put a prototype in Don's lap. There was a grown man with a teddy bear in his lap, and he held it like it was real. Larry Larson. And Don Kingsborough said, I don't want to give you money. I want to make this. That moment took place on February 3rd, 1985, and less than two weeks later, a letter of intent was signed between Don and Alchemy 2 for the exclusive licensing rights to Teddy Ruxpin and to the Animagic technology that brought him alive. After that meeting, he instantly got on the phone to five or six people and said, meet me in my house on Sunday. I'm flying back. We've got to act now. And told Ken Forsey, let me just have this for a week. I want to show it to some key people. He invites everybody over for dinner. We have dinner. He brings out Teddy Ruxpin, turns it on, talking, eyes blinking. Everybody went, oh my God. And Don said, I think we need to start a toy company. Are you guys in? We all bought in. We got one of these executive office buildings where you get a conference room and they give you a little place to sit and you get a person who answers the phone for everybody in the building. That's how we started. And then we got a building that we were gonna move into, still looking for financing, which took us a while to do. We had trailers in the parking lot of the building that we were gonna rent. As for the name of the new company that Don suddenly found himself running, he already knew its acronym would be W-O-W, or WOW, to attract the attention of those who played the stock market. He reverse engineered a name from this, and Worlds of Wonder was born. And we all decided when we were thinking, who are we going to use as our ad agency? We said, let's go get Shy a Day. So I literally, I called Jay Shiat and Guy Day. He says, look, we're a new company. We have this really great product. We want to show it to you. And then Guy Day says, you know, we're opening up an office in San Francisco. So why don't you come in? He goes, we don't do toys. Let me just tell you, we don't do toys. Don Kingsborough and Paul Rago came into my conference room and they were carrying this black garbage bag with them. And then after we got into the meeting, Don walked over to behind the chair he was sitting in and put this thing on the conference room table, pushed a button in the back, and it started talking and said, hi, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. And they're all very stoically looking at this. And I'm thinking, I don't know know if I've got them or if I've lost them. And he said, just give us a minute. They all left the room and they came back and they said, I think we told you at the beginning that we don't do toys. And I thought, okay, we lost them. He goes, but for this product, we're going to take a gamble. A personal check with Worlds of Wonder handwritten at the top was used to secure Shiat Day's services in the toy marketing business. 
That was on a Thursday. Their first project, a selling kit, was needed the following Monday. Well, I knew we had the weekend ahead of us. <laughs> we were going to be there and putting it together. But fortunately, I had my two creative people. And they loved the idea of getting a toy. So they were perfectly happy to work the weekend. And we just put this sort of plan together. It wasn't as sophisticated as it should have been, but it was enough for a selling kit. And with Don as a mouthpiece, you could have had a bag of shit there. He would have sold it or he would have taken it and run with it. In a trailer with a taped on sign that read, Engineering, Worlds of Wonder employees were working hard at turning Alchemy 2's rough prototype into a consumer affordable and safe product. And Ken Forsey in particular was very instrumental in the final look of Teddy and what we could and could not do to Teddy getting him into production. The prototype of Teddy had a consumer product tape deck that was slightly modified. So for production, we had to use a tape deck that we could buy for a dollar that was integrated with the body box. And then we had to tool our own servo motors. While we didn't use servos per se, we very much simulated what a servo would do with discrete components on the inside. And we brought all that together and we were then able to make a production version of Teddy. While all of that was transpiring, Don had to secure funding or everything would be for naught. He had been trying to attract investors with the idea that WOW could go from zero to $70 million in sales. Normally this would generate a considerable amount of interest, but Don intended for the talking toy to debut that year. Nobody took him seriously. He adjusted the figures, despite standing firm behind the originals, to $50 million in sales and $3 million in profits. Three days later, he was holding a check for $15 million from the Abercrombie family of Houston, Texas. Don went for broke, and what we developed in that period of time, because if you look at the fact that Hasbro said it's going to take us four years, and we got to market in nine months, I mean, it's hard to believe. So people were being hired right and left. Things were going on all over. There was music. There was laughter. My God, we were going to make payroll every week, and we were all glad we stayed. With the injection of money into the company's bloodstream, Alchemy 2 now had to hire more of everyone in order to prepare storybooks for The World of Teddy Ruxpin, as it was now being called. Artists were brought on board in order to finalize the look of not only the characters, but the geography of the land of Grundo as Ken had envisioned it. I was in Ken's office every day as we talked about every one of these characters. And Ken was a great artist in his own, but he said to me, my style is not commercial enough. And so I would do drawing after drawing of Teddy using what he had. It was his drawing. And then I sat there and as they were creating the doll, we would redraw Teddy. And Ken and I would sit there and I'd go in his room every day and show him the drawings, say, is this closer to what you're thinking about? And we would work on them together. And he would say, yeah, I like the head. I, I don't like the head. I really want it to be like more like a football. He had the vision of Teddy in his head and I had to draw it out of him. I would just read the story and then pretty much everything just kind of came out of my mind as far as the background elements. I didn't really have any reference in particular. It would just kind of come out of my pencil. I mean, it's all very organic, you know, and just talking with Ken and going over on different ideas and he liked it, doing rough sketches and showing him and he would guide me. So it just kind of grew, I guess. And David sat on one side of a wall and I sat on the other side and we laid out books and we had to do 13 books in less than six months. And the only way that we could create those books in such a fast time that we just set it up like animation. David would do a layout and I would put the characters in and then we would have someone ink it and then someone would paint it. They would use markers. These girls were phenomenal being able to blend marker into making it look like watercolor. After Ken decided that Larry's voice was not right for the part, Terry McGovern, who would go on to voice Launchpad McQuack in DuckTales, was brought in to fill the role alongside Tony Pope as Newton Gimmick and Will Ryan as both Grubby and Twig. Yeah, so, so Grubby's, uh, I had a friend named Bill Scott, who was the voice of Bullwinkle. Bill always called those kinds of characters smart goofs. I said, what do you mean smart goofs? He said, well, they sound goofy, but they're actually smart, which I thought was interesting because their lines were smarter than they would appear to be, if you know what I mean, you know? Not long after casting, it came to be that McGovern was not going to be able to stay on as the voice of Teddy. Faced with losing one third of the main characters, Ken turned to George Wilkins and Will to find someone, quite literally, that night. 
I said, remember that album, Ken, that uh, I gave you? The other guy on there is already a tenor, so he sings in the key that we've done this stuff in. It would be very easy for him to come in and, and do those parts. Will had suggested one of his former partners in crime, Phil Barron. They had performed as Willio and Filio, styled as 20th century troubadours, before signing with Disney and recording, among other albums, Goin' Quackers, as well as doing voiceover work on a very familiar show, Welcome to Pooh Corner. Michelle and I were watching TV at like 10.30 at night, and the phone rings, and it was George Wilkins. And George said, hey, Phil, uh, you know, I'm working on this toy project right now. I wonder if you could come down and just do the singing voice for this character. I said, sure, when, when do you want to do it? And he said, uh, now. <laughs> so I drove down there, sang a little to them, and they said, uh, they, they got on the talk back and said, yeah, that sounded great, Phil. Uh, could you read a couple lines for us, too? So they put a script in front of me, and I said, Hi there, how are you? I'm Teddy Ruxpin. And they got back on the talk back, and they said, What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I was first introduced to Teddy after Phil was cast as the voice, and he took me in to take a look at the toy, and I was charmed. It was very cute. It was a prototype. It wasn't the finished toy yet. I didn't know how people would react to it. Are children going to be okay with the toy actually speaking? Is it going to scare them? Is it going to be just odd? Are they going to be upset that if they ask Teddy a question, he's not going to answer? But Teddy himself was so cute looking, and I knew Phil's voice would melt hearts and make a connection, a deep connection. You know, I really had my fingers crossed the whole time. (laughs) With the trio of heroes set, Alchemy 2 went about recording storybook scripts and songs as fast as Ken and George could churn them out. We all recorded together. It was almost like a live show. I mean, we would do like segments of the storybook. So whatever we could get done in a three-hour session was pretty much what we did. I mean, sometimes there'd be two stories and sometimes there'd just be one, depending on the length of them and the complexity of them. Not only would Teddy Ruxpin and later his friend Grubby be talking toys, they would also be animated meaning that there was to be expressiveness emanating from them, albeit limited due to the nature of the technology. But Ken knew just the type of person needed for the job. He turned to puppeteers. Come dream with me tonight. Hi, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. Can you and I be friends? I really enjoy talking to people. The way Teddy was originally programmed, it was an eight-track magnetic tape that was on this big, huge, reel-to-reel machine. I look at it now and I say, oh my gosh, how antiquated. But at the time, it was very advanced. It was connected to this toy. It was just a head sitting on a stick with wires all coming out of it. There was a joystick box I held in my lap. And most of the time I worked with the late great puppeteer Van Snowden. And the band would basically be in charge of recording what I put down with the movements on the joystick. But Van would tell me whether or not the illusion worked. So I depended on him heavily to know that I had created the look that needed to happen. Because after a while of just staring at that mouth, and memorizing the script, you needed a second opinion. After we laid down all of the speaking functions of Teddy, we would play it back and see if it was clean all the way through. And then we would go back and we would put the eyes in. Every once in a while, we would have the mouth open in a smile. But as a rule, if there wasn't a voice coming out, the mouth was not programmed to move. There was also the matter of creating the sounds of Ken's fantasy world. They had to be unique, yet recognizable enough in order to capture the interest of the child listening along to the stories. It was just the most classic creation for them to have their adventures in the ships. There was something about the technology in Ken's world that he created for Teddy. It's very mechanical. There's a dash of magic, but there's no like strange electrical things or sounds or hums or buzzes you have to come up with. It needs to sound like it's put together with the very best kind of tissue paper and spit. and. <laughs> As it turned out, I had very recently gotten my first sampling keyboard that made it very quick and easy to change the pitch or reverse its direction. The sound that ended up being was my parents' player piano with the front taken off of it. 
But then when I slowed that down to half speed, the sounds kind of separated and you could suddenly hear each individual component doing its thing. That is the airship. The ship lifted off the ground and Newton Gimmick was delighted with his new invention. But somehow something still didn't seem quite right. Do you know what it was? Teddy, something still doesn't seem quite right. And I think I know what it is. Whoa! Hey, we're tipping over. Watch out, Grubby! The airship had turned upside down and crashed. To his credit, Ken understood the importance of collaboration. And while he may have been particular about the overall design of his characters, he was not unwelcoming to the ideas of others. This was a valuable trait, because he could only write so many songs and stories while juggling everything else Alchemy 2 had going on in the lead up to launching the talking toy. When I first was introduced to Teddy, I had no idea what the backstory of Teddy was. All I knew was they showed me this talking teddy bear, and I thought, oh, that, that's neat. When they said this is going to be a really big hit, I thought, okay, you know, I've heard that before. I really had no idea what was going to happen. It probably wasn't for several months before I sat in Kim's office and saw a little bit of the history of Teddy Ruxpin and how long he had been working on it and how it had developed. Ken and I had a really close and very special relationship, and he showed so much trust in me. And I think he realized pretty early on that I could internalize what he was thinking to the point where I could also start writing for Teddy. And he asked me, because he was running out of time in the day, hours in the day, we were collaborating. And then after a while, he just said, come up with ideas and run them by me and then just go for it. I went up to Ken and said, you know, this is terrific. And I love this story. But, um, you know, there aren't many females in Teddy's world. And he said, you're right. Want to write some? I came back with a half a dozen female character ideas and said, um, yeah, I really like these. Uh, would you like to introduce them in a story? The first character I wrote the story for was Amanda the Ladybug. Ken was so willing to take risks on people he knew who were creative. The first storybook that was completed under the Worlds of Wonder licensing deal and with Phil Barron as the voice of Teddy Ruxpin was The Airship, an abbreviated version of Teddy and Grubby meeting Gimmick, flying off into the sky and needing the help of Leota to correct the design flaws of Gimmick's invention. The Airship would be packaged with the Teddy Ruxpin talking toy and feature a dedication to Ken's late wife, Wendy. He wanted so much to prove to her and to the family that all the sweat and tears and the years that we did without family vacations and new clothes and new this and new that, the things he wanted to be able to provide the family and the sacrifices we made for him to be able to create his dream, she didn't get to see it. She missed it by just such a short period of time. She had faith in him and knew that it would be a success and she told him that all the time. bound to work this time. I failed again. How about these, Master? Hi there. My name is Teddy Ruxpin. How are you today? Fine. Well then, I would like to Teddy tell you Ruxpin. It's alive! The world's first animated storytelling toy. It's alive! Now available at stores everywhere. It's alive! A lot of this is from memory and a very fuzzy memory at that. But our first commercial was the Frankenstein spot. It basically, as we were talking, Mike and I, about 
a friend for life comes to life, can we dramatize it? Because I mean, Don was very clear that this should not be a Me Too product. So to do that, we needed to get something pretty radical. This idea of a friend for life comes to life. We presented that storyboard. He immediately said, yeah, let's do it. And we had just worked with a director back in New York and said, you know, we've got this idea. What do you think? Can we create this environment? And got back to us and said, yeah, we can build the entire castle that all of this took place in. So we thought, okay. And we told Don about it. And he said, that'd be great. Let's go for it. Don went home after he saw the commercial. He took it home with him. And his wife was having this party. She had a bunch of her girlfriends over. And he said, hey, I want you to see something. And all of them, oh, my God, they're going to scare my kid and all this stuff. He called me at home. He said he wasn't going to run the commercial. That cost me another day of my life. The next day, trying to convince him to run it, which we did. What's interesting is the whole thing sort of leveraged the magical world of teddy bears. And Mike and I have worked together for so long that we kind of have a certain way of building on each other's questions, if you will. We said, you know, in a way, Teddy is just one of those great icons. And before he even opens his mouth, he represents a very cuddly and warm and empathetic friend more than anything else. the most interesting toy commercial I've ever done. I think it's uh, it's got to be this year's toy commercial, if not this century's toy commercial. Follow me, sir. Well, the challenge in doing this was to uh, make Igor ugly, but not, you know, so ugly that it would be frightening to Teddy. Um, it was, you know, a question of how many warts, and I had to go easy on the warts because I really didn't want to scare Mr. Ruxpin. Wow, Teddy sure has come a long way. Already he's doing commercials. Pretty soon, maybe movies. Then, who knows, he may start dating. Probably the last 10 years as an assistant director and uh, Scarface with Pacino, um, Blowout with John Travolta. Uh, we just did a Bruce Springsteen video. And I guess you could, you could pretty much compare Teddy with those people. I mean, Facts. And roll the camera. Okay, move a little bit, Doc. It's fine. Move a little bit. Uh, of the commercial we were doing, Teddy had really needed some understudies, and we had no problem finding some great bears that we're doing off-Broadway. Look at Doc. You're turning too much, huh? Slower. Okay, cut. Let's do it again. He's a great performer, and he's a great human being for a teddy bear. You're reacting to your... You're reacting to you. He's alive. Yeah, it's fine. Fine. Not a little bit. Over here, look over here, look over here. The thing about Teddy was that uh, he always, he always seemed to know what to say. Um, he, he never needed a script. Action! Hi there, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. How are you today? Hi. Hi. Well then, it's alive. I would like to tell you. It's alive. I have seen it. It's alive. <laughs> Teddy Ruxpin, a talking teddy bear soon to be available at retail outlets for between $50 and $80, was appointed Thursday as the official spokesbear for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. To promote educational programs for children, the center will get 50 cents for each toy sold. The center plans to develop a school safety curriculum and use the toy bear as a teaching aid. The Tallahassee Democrat, September 27th, 1985. We were always looking because we thought Teddy had kind of a unique personality. We talked to a few nonprofits 
And it seemed to make the most sense for the National Center. We went to D.C. You know, we did a little demo. It was a natural connection. Children found that Teddy was kind of a kindred spirit, a friend. And I think Teddy just provided another point of entry or another milestone in connecting with kids. What's up, Teddy? You look like you feel bad. I do, but I'm not sure what to do. You know, sometimes kids feel bad if someone does something to them they don't think is right. Yes, but remember, kids, you did nothing wrong. Tell someone you'll feel better. Protect yourself. Dear Ken, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for all of your hard work and dedication on this project. We are extremely proud to be partners with yourselves and Worlds of Wonder in this nationwide effort to bring child safety and protection guidelines to the families of America in this unprecedented and incredibly unique way. You are to be commended for your considerable contributions and demonstrated commitment to the Teddy Ruxpin Project. Jay Howell, Executive Director, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I can help teach children important messages which may help to keep them safe. As the official spokesbearer, I will embark on a nationwide program to educate children on preventing injustice and protecting themselves. Our commitment to children and their civil rights played an important role in our corporate philosophy. We wanted to provide toy products with exceptional play value and help to create a safer, more enjoyable world for our children. As the official spokesbearer for the National Center, Teddy Ruxpin will be an outspoken proponent for children and their right to live happy and fulfilled lives without being robbed of the enjoyment of growing up. Don Kingsborough. The day that was announced, I was in the first, like, five people that heard about it. And Ken, like, had tears in his eyes. He was so thrilled about it. I was so excited for him and excited. I remember I bounded down the hallway telling people, and I told his daughter, and it turned out <laughs> that he really wanted to tell his daughter himself. And he was so mad at me for spilling the beans. But the point is, I want to say of all the things that honored him or that happened, that came together for Ken, that was the one that moved him the most. That meant the world to him. Don Kingsborough wanted to debut the world's first animated talking toy in style. And since Worlds of Wonder had missed that year's Toy Fair, held annually in New York City since 1903, he had Steve Smith's PR firm book a spot in Central Park for September. It had been roughly seven months since Don had first set eyes on Ken Forsey's Iliop, and now it was time to share the world of Teddy Ruxpin with the masses. Let's keep the world safe for the children. Let's keep it a good place to be. Let's keep the world safe for the children. They're counting on you, and they're counting on me. Let's keep Teddy Ruxpin, and good morning. We are here today to announce the amazing new technology which has brought me to life right before your eyes. As you might have guessed, I am the first animated storytelling toy, combining the wholesomeness and tradition of my teddy bear ancestors with this breakthrough technology. The Teddy Ruxpin dream is to become a friend to children and explore their imaginative and creative spirit. And now I'd like to introduce one of my best friends, Mr. Don Kingsborough, chairman of Worlds of Wonder, my parent company. Thank you, Teddy. In the 1980s, children have become demanding consumers. 
They are selective about the toys they want their parents to buy for them. And they play a critical role in determining the fortunes of firms which manufacture and market such products. At the same time, parent looks for toys which are positive and that contribute to the children's growth and understanding of their world. In that spirit, Worlds of Wonder is pleased to introduce the world's first animated talking toy. Over the years, children has always had a special friend to share their thoughts and dreams with. And now for the first time, that special friend can share his thoughts and dreams with them. There truly exists a collective belief that what we are doing is proper and good for the children of America. Worlds of Wonder is proud to have as its major investor JSA interest of Houston, Texas here today. It is with a great sense of pride and appreciation that I introduce Josephine Abercrombie. Thank you, Don. I'm delighted to be here today and to be a part of this exciting toy phenomenon being introduced in America. My personal investment in Teddy Ruxpin and Worlds of Wonder was more than just a good business decision. Because you see, I too believe that Teddy Ruxpin can provide good, wholesome, fun and adventure which will provide and capture the imaginative spirit of children everywhere. That's what Teddy Ruxpin and Worlds of Wonder are all about. Not only is Teddy Ruxpin a breakthrough product with revolutionary technology, but he's also a friend to children in a world in which sometimes friends are very difficult to come by. I believe that the people at Worlds of Wonder are, have the expertise, the experience, the commitment to make Teddy Ruxpin an outstanding toy success in 1985 and beyond. But also, I think that they will extend that success into programs which will help children all over the world. I'd like to wish them, and especially Teddy Ruxpin, the very best of luck. Thank you. Thanks, Don. I couldn't have said it better myself. Worthwhile dreams hardly ever come true overnight. And ours has been in the making for years and years. In fact, more than 50 years of combined effort have gone into my evolution, from the drawing board and early prototype to the cute, cuddly bear you see now. Ken Forsey, Larry Larson, and all of the people at Alchemy 2 are responsible for bringing me to life. These are the people who gave life to lots of other animated friends across the country at Disneyland, Marriott's Great America, and Epcot Center. Just think, my larger animated relatives often cost $2 million and weighed 1,200 pounds. A little too expensive for the working mom and dad. And besides, I wouldn't want one of those guys sitting on my lap. <laughs> so, how did they fit all that expensive and heavy technology into my trim two and a half pound body? Well, I'm not much of an inventor. So I'd like to introduce Larry Larson from Alchemy 2, who created me. Larry? Thank you, Teddy. Hello. The entire creative staff of Alchemy 2 would like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Teddy Ruxpin began as the dream of one man, Mr. Ken Forsey. Nearly 25 years ago, the characters and the, the places that you will all become very familiar with were being created by Ken. But it wasn't until a little over three years ago that Ken began to experiment with what would become the Animagic technology. There were five of us in Ken's garage during those formative times. There are over 65 of us now that make up the Alchemy 2 family. We began by seeing a need for more expression in those costume characters that we are all familiar with in theme parks, on television, in motion pictures, a need for more animation. We started utilizing very lightweight, very accurate electric motors to produce smooth, natural animation movement. The technology proved to be so reliable, so lightweight, and so cost-effective 
that we turned our attention to the consumer market. Hence, the phenomenon of Teddy Ruxpin. It's taken us over two years to fully develop the characters and the technologies that are present in the world of Teddy Ruxpin. And with the truly close and loving relationship between Alchemy 2 and Worlds of Wonder, Ken Forsey's dream of Teddy Ruxpin, the little Iliop who made good, has become a reality. Thank you, Don. Thank you all. And my friend, thank you, Teddy. Worlds of Wonder would also like to present one of the first Teddy Ruxpins to arrive in the United States to Greg Forder, a patient of St. Vincent's Hospital who is waging a strong battle against cystic fibrosis. Greg? I'd like to uh, answer any questions at this time, if there are any. Yes. Uh, where's the name Ruxpin come from? I think Larry should answer that. Borrow, borrow Teddy's mic for a second. Uh, the name Teddy Ruxpin came from the fertile and, and inventive mind of Mr. Ken Forsey. It's uh, a pet name of his. Well, Don, I guess that about wraps it up. Have we missed anything? I don't think so, Teddy. Oh, wait a minute. There's one important thing. Of course. How could I forget? Thank you all for coming and joining me in sharing our dream with you. Thank you. Discover the world with me. There are lots of people we can meet, lots of things to see. So come and discover the world with me. Oh, fun. Like what makes the leaves in autumn fall? What irritates a honeybee? Why are some people six feet tall? And others only three. What makes the snow in the winter fall? How does a sheepdog see? How come my favorite rubber ball can bounce into a tree? And sometimes when I trip and fall, why does the ground jump up at me? Huh, I never thought about that. Come and discover the world with me. There are lots of people we can meet, lots of things to see. So come and discover the world with me. that a snowflake knows just what shape it's gonna be. Now do you think a duck has toes? Why does a dog have fleas? Why are there freckles on my nose? What causes me to <laughs> sneeze? Where does a balloon go? Where do you set it free? And overnight a mushroom grows, but it takes years to grow a tree. How are you doing? Huh, don't ask me. Okay, a man discover the world with you. There are lots of people we can meet, lots of things to see. So come and discover the world. Come on, Teddy, let's go. <laughs> it's a world full of wonders, and it's here for you and me. Come and discover the world with me, my friend. My friend.
giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. And if our dreams are good, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real. If we Teddy, my feet are getting sore. Executives in the children's television industry say lifelike movements that are timed well with the soundtrack can make the difference between a successful show and a flop. Alchemy 2 has a heavy investment in technology for the adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. Although ABC put up nearly half of the $1.5 million production budget, Alchemy 2 had to come up with the rest. Squire Rushnell, an ABC Vice President for Children's Entertainment, said the usual budget for the time slot is $400,000 an hour, but that the technology is so extraordinary, we decided it was worth it. Alan Goldstein, The Los Angeles Times, November 19, 1985. With Worlds of Wonder projecting that one million units of the talking toy would be sold by Christmas, Ken found his characters and stories suddenly in demand. Even though he would not get to produce the puppet show in which he had invested so much time and effort, the opportunity to present his work using animated walk-around costume technology was too good to pass up. So I went up with Ken to Worlds of Wonder, and I said, look, I think we can do a hell of a live action piece, but it's going to be an enormous amount of construction, stages, sets. We're going to need to shoot for a couple of weeks, and this thing's not going to be cheap. And we got them to pony up and more than double the money. So they ended up putting in well over a million bucks. And we shot this thing, which was a Herculean. It was a very difficult show to shoot. I mean, it was huge for kids programming. We spent a modest fortune and we spent weeks in developing the thing and producing it, shooting it, editing it. The script for what became known as the live action special was essentially the one Ken had written in 1979 with a few minor modifications, including, but not limited to, the air sloop now being called the airship. Leota the wood sprite is in, the wargles are out, and within the world of Teddy Ruxpin they've actually been replaced with characters called grunges, but their arc with Prince Aaron as the iron warrior fighting Wooly, whose last name has changed to What's It and is purple now, isn't even in the 1985 special due simply to budget constraints. Ken wants to make sure all of his Grundonians are represented, so he takes the wizard's cameraman, Louie, and decides, okay, sure, he's going to be a grunge, because he isn't described as anything in particular in the 1979 version of the story. Really? Well, this information ought to be worth something. Okay, put the film on the machine. So Ken, as a good uh, audience member, really appreciates a great villain, <laughs> right? Because villains are so much fun. They get to do things that nobody else does. They get to defy convention. And Twig is the most outlandish character as performed. He's ridiculous. He's based a little bit on Hans Conried. I'm sure I've got the right combination this time. <laughs> Just think to actually make gold out of buttermilk. He's louder than anybody else. And just uh, everything about him is grand. He's so conceited. Oh, they'll take every bit of that treasure. Uh, they're landing. There won't be anything left for me. Uh, they're landing. Why does it always have to happen to me? He just does whatever he wants. And in real life, I can't stand people like that. But in fiction, we love people like that. One of the more intriguing things that I saw that Ken had developed was a variation of what used to be called a multiplane animation camera effect. He wanted to do Teddy and his companions walking along a little country road. The physical characters we were filming were simply standing on a treadmill in front of a green screen to composite that section out and put another picture in its place. But 
he wanted to have a sense of at least a little bit of realism in this environment that they were walking through. And he brought an old-fashioned technique back to life in a very, very ingenious way. What he basically did was he had a series of plexiglass panels that were circular form, and there were like four concentric circles, a real small one in the middle, and a bigger one, and another bigger one, and a bigger one still. And each of these had some scenics attached to them, but they rotated at different speeds. And when they rotated, it created a remarkably realistic impression, and it was a remarkably simple device, absolutely brilliant in its ingenuity. The process for building the Hard to Find City, it starts with a drawing, so we have to take that and decipher how it was going to look dimensionally. You start working out all the elements that you want to build, which in this case was the building structure, and then you have all the rocks, and then all the finer detail that goes on inside of that. So once you work out what you're going to build and what's going to be on camera, that gets laid out and then the tasks are then assigned. So in this case, we had to make the columns that you see. We had to figure out what the material for the rock, which is all carved out of foam. And the columns themselves were originally carved out of foam and then they were molded. And then we made castings of those. So we have multiple castings and then those are used throughout the building. And then we start building all the elements, a lot of gluing in the beginning, and then a lot of carving of the rocks themselves. So once you start building it up and you start building all the pieces, it's basically one model without any kind of texture or paint attached to it. And then we had a scenic painter come and she finished everything off. And I think the process for this one, I think it took us six weeks from nothing to a finished model. It was super cool because we were back to doing animation, audio animatronic characters and doing big walk around costumes. So for me, it was awesome. At that time, I was beginning to phase out out of costuming and go into human resources. So I had turned over the helm of costuming to Arden Ashley. I think I still had a little bit of a hand in that. I know I was on the set a lot in the beginning. Building all those costumes took a lot of time and energy. Linda was very good about letting us know the big picture how all these characters fit into the story. She gave us some history on Teddy. We weren't just, oh, just build this costume. We were a part of it. This costume is this character, and these are his friends. We got a full rundown of the story. They were sweet characters. All of us, I think, ended up at some point or another working set because if you'd built the costume, you'd be the one generally to help adjust it. And we had fittings with all the actors that wore them so that they would be comfortable, that they could move in them. It was like a big family that all worked together. You worked very closely with the performers, which was really necessary. Once they showed me the art design for the Mud Bluff characters, it was pretty obvious that they didn't want to go to the incredible hassle of sculpting these entire bodies and then molding them, casting them in foam rubber, and cooking them. Because as it was, I would have had to build a whole new oven. The amount of electricity to power it would have been frightening. So I experimented with foam latex. I just took a sheet of plywood that was about one foot by, say, three and a half, four feet wide, whipped up a batch of foam, a fairly large batch, poured it out onto the plywood, which had been covered with tinfoil, poured it out along there, and then just tilted it so that it would flow downward kind of unevenly, and I'd rotate it to kind of control the flow so the flow was a little bit erratic. As soon as it flowed down enough, then I just flatten it back out, let it gel, then baked it up and then peel these pieces off. And I had these wonderful pieces of this kind of dripping, flowing, goopy kind of flesh. And then I could take these sheets and just wrap them around the undersuit structure that had been made by the fabrication department out of reticulated foam. And layer by layer, starting from the feet working up, I had just layer upon layer upon layer of this kind of melting, dripping, flowing masses that made up the whole body. It produced an extremely lightweight bodysuit, had a wonderful look to it, and then with just a little bit of paint and the paint all dripping and running to give the sense of more of the flow and the drip. Put this one to work and take the other two to the dungeon and lock them up. I got a call from Alchemy that they were looking for the tallest puppeteer in the world and that's why they called me because I'm six foot five and they wanted me to play the woolly what's it. Do you think we could get some water, please? No! Go away! Hey, you! Get out of there! 
What did you say? So I went out to talk to them about that, and I saw they were building costumes there. They were building all these foam shapes that people were going to wear. And I said, well, you know, I've spent my life building things out of foam. Can I come help do that? The whole special was a great learning experience for me because I learned a lot about being a set costumer because those of us who built the costumes, many of us anyway, were the ones who worked the set and helped all the performers get in and out of their costumes. And I think the whole Wooly What's It part of the show was all shot in two days, which was not easy because it was very hot and the head was very heavy. I bought a neck brace and also put a backbone, a plastic rod, into the costume to try to support some of the weight. I mean, I was in and out of the costume all day. I think the longest I was ever in it was a half hour, and that was pretty difficult because after a few minutes, it's like a sauna in there. Leota's costume was particularly challenging. The drawn Leota is so delightful. It's just a nice, cute little fairy and very clean and very ethereal. So they decided in the live action special that they were going to float <laughs> Leota on wires, of course, in a suspender, Peter Pan style. And then they decided that she would have these wings that that would light up on the edges. So they did plexiglass sheets, which were pretty heavy for top wings, bottom wings, both sides. The thing weighed a ton. They decided to make her cartoony by doing like weird glue-on cheeky kind of prosthetic <laughs> no offense to whoever did the makeup and did those pieces, you did what you were told to do. Just what are you doing in my tree? Huh? Uh, 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 oh, who said that? I said that and I'll say it again. Just what are you doing in my tree? <laughs> it's a tiny flying lady. Hey, would you look at that? What is it? There were challenges on pretty much every level I could think of as we shot that thing. The guy that played Teddy Ruxpin, first name is Jimmy, was a very well-known small person actor. He was also not a stranger to alcohol. So in the mornings, it would not be too unusual if he had maybe a, a couple of pops before he went on set. I do remember a time when the toy company came down, and, and I think the network was with them, and they were spending a ton of money, so clearly they were a little nervous about how this whole thing was unfolding. That particular scene called for Jimmy as Teddy to be walking along the airship as it was flying. And the airship was sort of semi on gimbals. And there's Jimmy coming towards camera and he's kind of reeling back and forth. And the head of ABC goes, God, that's such amazing acting. Like you almost believe he's on an airship that's flying. I had a hunch that it wasn't so much the acting as perhaps the alcohol that was creating the actor to be reeling. And sure enough, he was. He pulled that head off. And man, he reeked the booze. And that was like 10 o'clock in the morning. When we design things, it's always wise to try to figure out, okay, if something goes wrong, what's our backup? What's our plan B? This is something where Ken and I kind of differed because my background was much more movie work. And whenever you take something out on the set, you expect things to go wrong. Ken was different from me in that if you think it through completely and perfectly, then when you commit to a process, it's going to work perfectly because you've thought it out so carefully. So when it came time to our talking about the radio control systems to operate the servo motors inside the head masks the characters were going to be wearing, they were going to go with a wireless signal from the control to the characters. I went to Ken and Larry one day and I kind of nudged up to him and I said, you don't want to consider a hardwire backup? Well, they said, no, it's going to work perfectly and so we don't need it. And we go over and we start setting up for the first day and they get everything set up and they're going to just run through the first shot. They fire up the system and they start transmitting their programmable signal to the characters' heads and the character heads start going nuts. You're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that wasn't programmed. Turns out that people on the next stage were using walkie-talkie systems for all the communication of the crew, and their frequency was the same frequency we were transmitting on to send our controls. So none of the characters were operating at all. They literally had to scrap all filming for the first day. Ken, Larry, and the electronics team had to pull an all-nighter wiring up a hard wire connection from their program control to the character so they could film the next day. No one had ever shot something like this. I mean, it was unique. No one had ever deployed this type of technology. So to his credit, I mean, Ken was a visionary whom could sort of reverse engineer, as it were, 
what his idea would be creatively for what he thought this character should be in the story and figure out physically how to deliver a talking head. One final revision that Ken had made to his fantasy epic was the physical nature of the treasure that Teddy initially sets out to find. No longer ceramic discs, and now six in number rather than seven, the treasure took on the form of crystals emblazoned with the following words. The imagination. Honesty. Bravery. Trust. Friendship. The heroes would pocket them as before in order to make their daring escape, a not so easy cinematic feat from a production standpoint. Maybe my biggest scene in that show was shot against blue screen. It was Willie running amok on the Gatang airfield, and I think I smashed two different planes, or maybe it was just one plane that I broke up so it couldn't leave the ground and attack the airship. I dashed across the stage and then had to jump and land on the Gatang wing, and this was a life-size model, and we'd only have one shot at it, because if I didn't jump right, if I landed awkwardly or something, there was no time to rebuild a Gatang plane. But fortunately, it went well well, and I jumped and landed on the wing and it smashed and then I ran away again. There was another one where Willie's supposed to jump off the cliff and land on a Gatang plane. I think they just had the camera still, but they showed maybe six feet down the cliff. So wearing this big costume, I had to jump and maybe land about eight feet below me because that would get the costume out of frame. They had put out some foam pads for me to land on. I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. The shot had to be high enough above the ground that Wooly would leave the frame. Because Ken was such a really nice man and treated everyone so well, I think everyone that I remember working on that special, it was like we all had a vested interest in making this succeed. We all wanted it to succeed for this man. He was not a guy who would take all the credit for everything. He was the first one in the room to say, oh, and so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that. And so I think he was a very generous man in acknowledging all the different people that worked on these things, from the people that worked on the toys, the people who worked on the costume characters. I mean, he was just a stand-up guy, and in all the years I'd worked, there aren't that many of them. Again, I think it just comes from his humble beginnings and seeing the worth of the team that he had created behind them and was really big on giving credit to the people that helped him get his dream to become a reality. He realized it took a village and he wanted those around him to be recognized for their hard work. Well, I adored Ken. I mean, Ken was a very solid guy, genuinely likable, a very sound and very kind individual. That if he trusted you, and that took a lot, then he gave you the world. I just loved watching him. He'd come on set and he just would smile because he was so happy to see what clearly had been going on in his head for all those decades come to life. And he was very pleased with the show. I mean, I think I was proud of that show. I think we did a pretty solid job, everybody involved. The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin aired over the course of two Saturday mornings, November 30th and December 7th, drawing huge ratings. The show became a hit and was aired again and again over the coming months. Then it was released on home video and sold millions of copies, satisfying ABC's initial investment in spades. If there were any parents still unaware of the world's first animated talking toy, their children would make sure that that was no longer the case. Let's meet a lovely princess and stand before a king. Let's dream a great and let us live that magic dream and if our dreams are good and if we see it through look there's my home there's my home then the wondrous dream we dream tonight someday just might come true
He is Teddy Ruxpin, billed as the world's first high-tech teddy bear. Let's watch the ground. What do you think of that? Oh, I love it. I love to take him home with me. You want one? Yeah. Yeah? Why don't you pet him? He's eighty dollars, Mom. Hey, you don't want. You don't really want one. <laughs> He's talking. <laughs> Teddy is the latest entry in the high-stake toy business, manufactured by California's World of Wonder. The company hopes the bear pulls in $68 million in sales this Christmas. There is no closer companion for a small child than a teddy bear. When you were lonely and sad, or everyone was too busy to play with you, Teddy was always there. Your problems seemed to melt away with one look at its button eyes and infectious grin, or one squeeze of its chubby plush body. The special relationship between child and teddy bear was always one-sided. You talked while Teddy looked sympathetic, but three toy manufacturers hoped to change that situation for the modern child. Now coming onto center stage are Gabby Bear, Teddy Ruxpin, and A.G. Bear, high-tech talking teddy bears. Sandy Trazo, script Howard New Service. Created by Jack Winters and voiced by Dick Beals, better known for his role as Elka Seltzer's mascot Speedy, Gabby Bear was similar to Teddy Ruxpin in that it told stories and sang songs. Unlike Teddy, however, Gabby would animate to any cassette tape placed inside of it. A.G. Bear was created by Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, and was a much simpler version of a talking toy. Children would speak to it, and A.G. would mumble back their words to them in what was dubbed Bear Talk. A.G. just isn't something that you watch or play with. He's your friend. And you talk to him, and he's your talking to friend, and, uh, and he answers you, and he understands you, and he loves you. <laughs> These other talking bears were slapped together once word got out about the Animagic technology that Alchemy 2 had developed. And while there were plenty of kids who got a Gabby bear or an A.G. bear and cherished them, it's the world of Teddy Ruxpin that kept going and racking up the sales. We try to deal with Teddy as a character. We're concerned with what he does, not how he does it. When dealing with young children, you don't want technology for technology's sake. There's a relationship between a child and a toy. All the technology is totally invisible. Don Kingsborough. Teddy Ruxpin crushed the competition due to two reasons. Production quality and, more importantly, the high level of storytelling. There is an endearing nuance to it all, and it's to Ken's credit. He knew what he wanted, got Worlds of Wonder to give him that oversight, and his alchemists were all on board to support his vision. We brought five factories. I went from factory to factory to factory every day. Not just the primary manufacturer. We controlled all of the components that went into it, too. You know, I had to fly to Taiwan and get their components lined up. And the manufacturer that was making some of the parts for the motors and the tooling vendor, which was a separate factory. Oh, my God, that was crazy. But that's what we did. The advertising was so great. The PR was so aggressive. And the product was so sweet and the technology is so novel. We knew enough about consumer products to know that you check all those boxes. We set on a price point and whatever the cost of goods was and that price point, that was going to be our margin. The people who came up with Teddy Ruxpin were obviously confident that they had something in the industry that was innovative, untried, and that would be successful with retailers and children. If you haven't laid eyes on Teddy Ruxpin, that's because the high-tech and high-priced Teddy is selling so fast, toy stores can't keep him on the shelves. Worlds of Wonder has sold almost 800,000 units and related products for a total of $70 million. If you want a Teddy Ruxpin, but you can't find one, you might be able to get a rain check at a toy store. The Ithaca Journal, November 28th, 1985. Kids and parents were talking about him. Word was out, demand was high, and shelves were empty. Retailers were left with displays and shortages. But I don't think anyone can fault us for that. We've leased 747s, we've leased DC-8s, and we're flying 60,000 teddies over at a time. Working on something like that that exploded was very surreal. He came out like right in time for Christmas. We did a limited run. He sold out. 
boom, he went to black market. And all of a sudden, alchemy was on the news. Worlds of Wonder was on the news. Teddy Ruxpin was all over. And it was a strange dichotomy. We suddenly started getting letters from all over the country. We suddenly started getting calls. People were making appointments to come in. It was very odd if you look back at the whole period that we went through when we couldn't make payroll and people were coming in to work for free. All of a sudden, everybody knew who we were. It was hard to know what to do with it. It was certainly fun, but it didn't feel real. It was a big Christmas for Teddy Ruxpin. I didn't really pin my hopes on it going much beyond that. There are funny stories like my mother-in-law standing in a Toys R Us and pointing at Teddy Ruxpin and saying, that's my (laughs) son-in-law. It was kind of neat when I found out that Vice President Bush and Barbara had a Teddy Ruxpin. Those kinds of things made me smile. (laughs) You can let it go to your head, I suppose. I really didn't. I always considered it a great privilege to be involved with this. Bringing the world of Teddy Ruxpin to children has been my dream for more than 20 years. The Teddy Ruxpin toy is a vehicle for teaching children values through stories by approaching it as an adventure rather than as a learning experience and making it interesting to children. Don Kingsborough knew what it took to get the project off the ground. We've never had more fun than we're having now. Teddy Ruxpin became the top-selling toy of 1985, launched with around a dozen storybooks alongside it, including The Missing Princess, Twig and the Bounders, and Take a Good Look. More would be produced the following year, helping Teddy maintain his top spot in 1986 as well. Ken Forsey's adventurous little Iliop had arrived, but even Ken could not have anticipated the issue that almost brought it all to ruin. People still talk about Teddy Ruxpin, but now, attention in the industry is focused on whether an unusually large number of the toys is defective. Larry Larson, an Alchemy 2 vice president, said the cassette unit that plays tapes of stories and controls the simultaneous movements of Teddy's plastic lips, cheeks, and jaws was not sturdy enough to withstand the rough play of some small children. Alan Goldstein, The Los Angeles Times, February 4th, 1986. Kids thought Teddy was their friend. They would take him swimming, not good for the technology, feed him spaghetti and meatballs, not easily digestible. One kid proudly said that they had Teddy play right field on his little league team, and obviously he didn't catch many of the balls out there. So we came to the conclusion that Teddy was a friend, and when you think of Teddy as a friend, things are going to happen. They're going to impact his ability to function. So we did a couple things to minimize it, but we knew that eventually some kid were going to break it. And when I broke that news, and I personally had to break that news to the executive team, it was amazing because I was sweating bullets. This is what I said. I got in trouble for it. These are all going to come back. There was a design flaw in the first generation talker where if you didn't put the cassette in properly, then slam the door shut, the tape drive broke. As the troubleshooting was going on for that, I got sent to Seattle one day on really short notice to go to a warehouse to look at a lot of the returned failed teddies to try to determine what was one of the big failures. And found this warehouse and went inside and they had a big pile of teddy that had these open boxes, take them apart and try them until we could get some information on what was failing. And I would pass that back down to Dave and team so they could make changes and talk to the manufacturers and change things as fast as possible. And Worlds of Wonder was reporting a 3.5% failure rate, but there were industry experts who felt they were underreporting. So there was this enormous amount of pressure to figure out how to address this. And to their credit, they did. Teddy Ruxpin is sick. Just how ill is unclear, but his condition is said to be very guarded. But there should be no cause for concern, according to Dr. Bearwell in the land of Grundo, where Teddy lives. In a letter to Teddy's unhappy friends from the toys maker, Dr. Bearwell notes that a special Grundo general hospital has been set up to take good care of him and send him back as soon as possible after he arrives. Teddy Ruxpin will be back before you know it. No matter how large or small the ailment may be, Worlds of Wonder is taking no chances. Not only has it redesigned the product to eliminate the infirmity, but also it has launched a kid's happiness program to patch up any ailing Teddy. Caroline E. Mayer, The Washington Post. Before becoming the lab coat clad, stethoscope wearing Dr. Bearwell, Clay Pimentel had been a financial manager at General Motors for 30 years. Upon retirement, he still wanted to work, 
but doing something fun. Within less than a week, on December 6th, 1985, he was working for Worlds of Wonder as a customer service representative. Speaking in a passive tone, the good doctor provided a reassuring voice to children and parents alike. Upon realizing that his last name might be too hard for his concerned juvenile clientele to pronounce, he told them to simply call him Dr. Clay. When one child asked if he was going to make their bear well again, someone in marketing caught wind of it and thus was born WOW's campaign to service and maintain Teddy Ruxpin. I immediately felt that Teddy Ruxpin was a bear who was going places. And he did. As a senior citizen, I had never seen anything like Teddy Ruxpin except at Disneyland. But I couldn't touch him there. Now an animated toy was available to hold and cherish as if you were at Disneyland. It became very easy to relate to Teddy Ruxpin because he cared about you, his friend. He always talked in the same tone of voice, but most of all, he never changed his mind. That is very important to children. For the first time, here was someone that was always pleasant, positive, helpful, and sharing so many neat things that children relate to. Clay Pimentel. After technicians, who were dubbed surgeons, fixed a child's Teddy Ruxpin, Dr. Clay made sure a tag was attached to it. The tag read, We're sorry your friend has been sick. Grundo General Hospital has given it the best of care. Thanks for your patience. Dr. Bearwell and the Grundo General Hospital Initiative proved incredibly successful, allowing everyone at Alchemy 2 and Worlds of Wonder to breathe a sigh of relief. To expand on Worlds of Wonder's commitment as a responsible toy manufacturer, the company developed a sophisticated consumer service department to interface directly with the end user. Dr. Bearwell's office ensures that each Teddy Ruxpin owner has a rewarding experience and that the company continues to provide only wholesome entertainment throughout its product line. An example of this outreach approach are the hundreds of needy children from Centers for the Handicapped who have been able to share in Teddy Ruxpin's many stories about learning, safety, friendship, honesty, and love. Diana Soltish, Vice President of Media Relations, Worlds of Wonder. The Teddy Ruxpin talking toy had endeared itself not only to the children it spoke to, but also to their parents. Ken could not have been happier, and neither could Dr. Bearwell, who, with a walk around Teddy Ruxpin in tow, embarked upon a nationwide goodwill tour, spreading the joyfulness of the character and his stories. Teddy Ruxpin's visit to the Children's Medical Center of Dallas was a special treat for children, families, and staff. His nine-minute show and room-to-room -room visits helped brighten the day of all he encountered. Teddy and the photographer both presented themselves in a very sensitive and caring manner to the children. Thank you so much for the 39 Teddy Ruxpin toys that we received. The children are greatly enjoying them. Your gift is an investment in young children who face critical illness and who teach us unforgettable lessons in patience, courage, and hope. Kimberly Myers Gordon, MS, Child Life Specialist. Dr. Bearwell and Teddy Ruxpin, in just a few months, traveled coast to coast, making stops in places like New Orleans, Louisiana, Omaha, Nebraska, and Newark, New Jersey. They appeared on radio shows and television programs and visited all sorts of establishments and institutions, never losing sight of the love children had for Ken Forsey's storytelling Iliop. Older folks even like him in the rest homes. He's a lot of company. The parents have said that the children listen to everything he says, but we don't want him to replace a parent. Teddy is a personal friend, but a child always needs a parent. He can teach good values, but the parents have got to follow through. Another phase we're really proud of is helping the children with learning disabilities. At a school for the deaf in New Jersey, the children can't speak or hear, but when they turn Teddy on, they put their hands on his tummy, watching him speak, and they can learn enunciations. Clay Pimentel. I really want to commend your company on the genius of Teddy Ruxpin. He is the cutest and most lovable bear to come along in a long time. The tapes have charm to them. The themes or topics you choose are wholesome and good. Thank you for bringing Teddy into the world to help restore its beauty. Marie B. Menlo Park, California. It just was a great privilege to be able to be a part of children's lives that way. To be able to speak to a child one-on-one -on -one in a way that could touch them and help them understand their world through a world of fantasy. Just a note to let you know how much my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and her parents and grandparents love Teddy Ruxpin. Thank you for making our daughter's childhood a little bit brighter with this delightful toy. The Sea Family, Mount Holly Springs, Pennsylvania. When people feel 
an honest connection. They're moved. They hang on to it. It's in them. They've been touched in an inner way that doesn't happen often outside of family connections. Even though Teddy couldn't listen and respond to you, it seemed that he did because the stories were honest and that he reacted to them emotionally and still rationally. He said, can you and I be friends? He extended his inner self to you. When I gave Teddy Ruxpin to my youngest daughter, who is four years old, I cannot begin to tell you the miracles that have begun to happen. She has never used her hands. Now she reaches out and strokes Teddy. She smiles at him and wrinkles up her face when he is in trouble. He truly keeps her company, and this indeed is a blessing. Josephine T., Costa Mesa, California. I think more than ever, children are surrounded by passive activities, television, video games. You see even tiny little kids playing with cell phones. Teddy Ruxpin is something that, while still a character, while still based on fantasy, is something real in their world that they can interact with. And I think it's far more of an important activity for children to listen to a story, to use their imagination. We just bought the Teddy Ruxpin lullabies. I actually cried when Teddy was singing my three-year-old daughter to sleep. What lyrics? What melodies? Only people with hearts of children and minds of a genius could produce such quality material. Mrs. Carrie Ketchum K, Whitset, North Carolina. Teddy affected people in ways that in all of my career, I have never seen it in any other way. I've never seen a toy have the kind of impact that Teddy had on people emotionally. The toy becoming so popular was a thrill on its own. It changed lives for everyone from infants to seniors with dementia, to children in critical care units and hospitals, to people in need, being their friend, talking to them, telling them stories in a soothing way, in a relatable way, in a cute way. So many people related to that toy, and that in itself was amazing. To whom it may concern, I have an eight-year-old, profoundly and severely, physically and mentally handicapped daughter. Her biggest pleasure in her short life is to have Teddy Ruxpin sing lullabies to her at nighttime. She also loves the cassette, Quiet Please. You have given great pleasure to a beautiful little child who gets little pleasure in this life. Very few things in my life as someone who produces products has moved me more since or has given me any sense of the ability to connect through storytelling. Teddy was connected with people so much. He was loyal. He was going to be with you forever. You can count on him. And I think it punched us, uh, not that we were taking anything lightly to begin with, but I think at that moment it dawned on me, at least, how serious this stuff was. And there was a real sense of honor and a sense of needing to be authentic and honest. And the values that Teddy portrayed were very seriously put forth on our part as something that we had to do. Having created this toy, then it had to have content that would have meaning. Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight.
Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream tonight. Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places. And search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's meet a lovely princess and stand before a king. Let's dream a great adventure and let us live that magic dream. The orange leaves of autumn will crackle in the air. In winter, tiny snowflakes will sparkle everywhere. And if our dream's a good one, and if we see it through, then the wondrous dream we dream tonight, someday, just might. Come true.